Hello, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Law Zoominar um, for the Talent App. And I'm delighted to have Helen O'Brien with us this evening to speak to everybody. Um, Helen has had a varied career, but all within the realm of law. Um, she started at Mishkondorea, um, and where she rose to being the youngest the youngest female partner of her time there before leaving and doing and going into other enterprises, which she will talk all about. So thank you very much, Helen, for giving us your time today. We greatly appreciate no it. No problem at all. I'm delighted. Well, I know because you have so many, you've had different roles. Um, tell us what you do at the moment um, <laughs> in general. Um, well, at the moment, um, I'm uh, a newly appointed um, Chief People Officer for the Tony Blair Institute, um, which is a not-for-profit organisation uh, established a number of years ago by Tony Blair. Um, but um, the, the, I suppose the series of events that led me to have the privilege of being able to undertake um, that role kind of take me back to my um, to my time as a lawyer. So as Naomi said, I, um, I worked at Mishkondorea uh, for 17 years. Um, I uh, actually undertook an internship uh, back in two, no, 1999, that was it. Seems a very, very long time ago, um, in 1999. <clears throat> and then I um, successfully obtained a training contract um, in 2001. Uh, which concluded in 2003 and I stayed um, at Mishcons uh, throughout my career until 2016. Um, whilst I was uh, in uh, my training contract, one of the reasons that I had applied to Mishcons as opposed to um, any other law firm uh, was uh, a deep interest that I held in the law of defamation, media, libel etc but ironically whilst i was going through my training contract i had the opportunity to work within the employment team um, which at the time was a very small team but a very um, prominent team led by two very successful um, and renowned employment lawyers and during the course of my training contract um, fell in love with the area of law and decided to um, have that be my area of speciality uh, so I uh, qualified into the employment team at Mishcons and I progressed through the traditional law ranks um, and became a partner in 2010. And then I left, as I said, Nay, in 2016 um, to go and work for one of my clients as their general counsel and chief operating officer, um, which was uh, a an interesting move at the time, um, but one of the aspects of the role that I had performed whilst being a lawyer was a deep interest, was having a deep interest in the business and people side of the organizations um, that I had the privilege to act on behalf of. And it was that interest in business and the ability to help influence and shape an organization in terms of its infrastructure and its people um, that really led me to take on the COO and general counsel role. Um, that was for a media agency, um, which had about 250 people uh, across New York, San Francisco and London. Um, so I had the privilege uh, of being able to experience multi-jurisdictional uh, multi uh, workflow and organisational structures. And with that came a responsibility for people and for the HR team. And I left that role having amassed a wealth of experience, something that I, I genuinely had not foreseen when I took on the role. Um, but everything from finance through to IT, through to um, infrastructure, through to buildings, through to leases, through to people, um, everything that was not client facing from the organization perspective, I was responsible for. And um, I decided to leave that role for many reasons, but primarily actually because I wanted to take a bit of a break. I'd been working at Full Pelt for what was then over 20 years and um, thought that it would be a good time just to take uh, a mini sabbatical, as I called it. Um, and I did that uh, for a few months and then happened to fall into 
um, consulting. Um, a number of old clients and contacts and friends reached out to me and asked if I would be able to help them with ad hoc projects that were primarily in the employment and HR space. Um, and I started to undertake various uh, projects or retainers, depending upon the clients that I had the privilege of being able to work with. And one of those clients was the Tony Blair Institute. And I started working for them back in October last year and throughout the course of me having been engaged to deliver quite specific talent strategy work, um, not only in relation to um, their people, but their wider desires and uh, long term uh, strategic goals from a people perspective, um, was then asked to take on the role of chief people officer, which is where I am now. Oh, brilliant and uh, yeah and, and, and fantastic and, and great and well done but congratulations for getting the role it's a fab role um so when you were talking about how you got into law you yeah. spoke about how you did an internship and i think you did that during your time at university and that yeah. really helped you to get and um, get that training contract at michigan can you talk us through how you did that how you got that because i don't think things have changed much now and and how that led you into michigan's sure so um I'm going to show my age now because when I had to apply for internships, it was uh, paper and pen and uh, you basically read uh, a book called Chambers or, or, um, uh, or uh, well, basically Chambers was the, was the uh, most important uh, Bible. And within that document, within that book, sorry, there were pages and pages of information about different law firms, not only what their areas of speciality were, but where they sat in terms of what is still known as the magic circle or silver circle or mid-tier firms. And also, you know, how many interns they took, how long the internship was for, etc. And at the time, um, I think I'm quite an unusual case in some description. So obviously at Nottingham, um, there's a huge... Uh, cohort of, of, of law students, um, the majority of whom were determined to find a home on the um, graduate, graduate programs or internship programs for the big tier uh, magic circle firms or the silver circle firms. And um, there were two reasons why I personally decided not to go down that route. First of all, I had a passion for an area of law that none of those um, organizations actually delivered um, or specialized in um, so i had to go and find the law firms that were the best in class in that particular field and the second um, reason why was because actually i didn't want to be one of an inordinate amount of people on a scheme um, typically those types of um, firms bring in anywhere between sort of 50 and 200 um, candidates during a summer internship or Easter internship program, depending upon which firm you are, um, which firm you're talking about. And I decided that I wanted to be one of six, one of eight. Um, so those were my own personal criteria. So I spent a lot of time researching um, the firms that would help deliver, hopefully, that ambition. Um, I probably applied to about 10 law firms um, in, in, in total for my internships. And that was um, after the second year of university. Yeah. So that was at the, yeah, that was at the start of the second year, sort of like first term of the second year of university with the internship program happening in the summer of my second year at university. And I was studying law at the time, not a non-law um, degree, which we can touch on later if that would be helpful. Um, and at the time, the internship program lasted for one month, which again was slightly unusual in the circumstances. Lots of firms often had uh, a two week only program. And the benefit of that one month program um, was that I then spent four weeks, one week in diff a different department. So I had the opportunity to, to, to get to know four different practices rather than just two. Um, and also, um, I, I felt quite passionately that I wanted to be able to have the opportunity to actually work rather than just be part of a huge cohort that sort of blindly went around uh, a law firm just being schmoozed rather than actually doing anything of, of 
um, anything of meaning. And I had the opportunity actually to work on some incredible um, cases. And I spent um, a lot of time with some more junior lawyers within the organization at the time who were allocated as buddies. So it was really good to be able to get to know them, to understand their journeys, to understand what had taken them to Mishkan, where their passions um, lay in terms of practice areas. And from that, I then had the opportunity to apply for my training contract. Um, and I had to go through another round of interviews to be able to get to the stage where, um, where I had the privilege of being offered my training contract. Um, and I started that in 2003. And um, if it would help, if you want me to just touch on the, the kind of the conclusion of the degree and what that means in terms of, of next steps. So as I said, guys, I studied law. Um, I didn't study uh, a, any other humanities subject or science subject, for example. Um, and um, for those of you that aren't aware, the still to this day, um, uh, process that one goes through is to conclude their law degree and then undertake what's called the LBC, the Legal Professional Qualification, um, which is a one-year course that is a, um, a kind of platform from which the more practical aspects of uh, the role of a solicitor are taught, learned, uh, and obviously examined. Uh, and that was a one year course that I actually undertook at the um, law school in Nottingham, which is not affiliated to the university. It's actually affiliated to the to the Trent University there. Um, I did uh, do that course with people who had not studied um, law at university um, and they had to undertake an additional year's worth of learning. Um, uh, through what's called the GDL um, and that is a very intense year long experience where you condense effectively a three-year law degree <laughs> into a one-year program um, which again is offered through law schools that then facilitate the LPC. Um, during my time I've, I've interviewed, employed and worked with a number of um, individuals who have gone down the GDL route so they've studied something non-law related at university and then done what we in the trade call the conversion course and um, I would say that actually in my experience um, there is very little in terms of um, difference between the lawyers that come out of university having done a law degree and those that have come out doing a non-law degree um, interestingly, I think if you if you get the right non-law degree, some of the skills that you learn through that process and through that education can be invaluable. Some of the best lawyers that I have ever worked with have studied psychology um, or studied English. It's quite forensic in the way in which one examines literature or, or you know, talks about it. Psychology uh, uh, graduates that I've had the pleasure of working with in terms of colleagues have had a great insight into the, the sort of the human psyche and the importance that that plays in terms of the way in which you negotiate or the way in which you're engaging with people or the way in which you may um, you know look to deliver strategy or any any of those things um, and uh, certainly if I'm being incredibly transparent a law degree can be very dry um, it can, it's, it's very time consuming. That's not to say that that's not important because it is, but ultimately it is, it's not a, um, it's not a, uh, a sexy subject that one then decide, you know, one can really get their teeth into. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, archaic legislation that you have to wade through to be able to get to the end point in a, in a particular module. Um, but it's an important, you know, it gives you a very, very important skills, particularly from, uh, the granular, sort of forensic examination that one needs to be able to do with skill when you are a lawyer, irrespective of the practice in which you then uh, specialise or qualify into. Um, so yeah, so I did the LPC and then I went uh, to Michigan's in London and I did my training contract for two years. Um, now, time has slightly moved on since I did my 
a training contract in terms of what um, a lot of law firms now um, offer. Um, and there are two parts. There are two. There are two parts to the training contract. Um, there is some additional professional qualification uh, uh, courses that one has to do, and what a lot of law firms now do is bring all of their graduates into the firm for probably a three-week period prior to their training contract job they're starting have that cohort undertake all of the professional qualifications in that three week period under tuition from a particular um, college and then start their training contract. And um, your training contract requirements through the um, solicitors regulatory authority and the law society require you to have both um, contentious and non-contentious experience. So that's, basically litigation and not litigation uh, and you have to be seen to be spending a certain amount of time across each of those um, disciplines in order to be able to establish that you can then assuming you have um, delivered to an acceptable standard and not done anything negligent or fraudulent um, become uh, uh, get the seal of approval to become a qualified solicitor. And in a training contract, can you undertake two years of a training contract and then not actually be employed by the firm that you've done the training contract under? Yeah, you can. Um, there are a number of websites that will show you the stats. Um, I was going to check, actually, and I will just check, because when I was at uh, Mishcon's, there was a website called Roll On Friday. Um, and yep it's still going and uh it's a sort of inside uh scoop on the legal profession uh it would you know it'll be a little um uh a little bit of a uh, tabloid-esque platform uh but equally does provide some very uh important data so what it does is seek to collect data across them so it could say like what you should be expecting from a salary perspective or an hours perspective or if people have fed back and said that you know this particular firm really values the fact that you should take your holiday or this particular firm uh doesn't value holiday or whatever it might politely be um or if there's some you know um scandal in a particular law firm it probably gets the inside scoop before other people do and and uh and then reports on it um but what tends to happen is that once you've gone through your training contract um conversations will be happening in terms of what roles are available across different practices because by their very nature obviously law firms are businesses and it's not always the case that every practice is able to create a new role each year to bring up um, a trainee solicitor who might want to qualify into that practice. It's obviously revenue dependent. It's, it's many other things dependent. So throughout my career, and at one point I was in charge of graduate recruitment at Mishcons. Um, and so throughout my career, I would say that probably if I had to do a bit of an average, I would say about 80% of trainee solicitors are retained by law firms within which they, um, to which they qualify. Um, some, uh, some trainees actually decide that they want to move in house, which I can talk to you about a bit as well, if that would be helpful. Um, some trainees decide that actually they don't want to be solicitors at all. They go through that entire process and realise at the end of their training contract that they would rather uh, experience another career. Mm -hmm. I know of two people who've left their law, uh, their roles in, in law firms and gone to work as recruiters. I know another person who decided to... Um, go and work as a consultant. Um, I was talking to somebody literally just last week who um, decided after spending a lot of time and energy at Allen and Overy to do his uh, training contract within six months of having qualified 
uh, to actually not continue to go and study for an MBA and then he went to be in, in, into consultancy um, and I think that uh, I think that what I am what I've seen over the years is that whether or not a person can find a home after their training contract within the law firm that they have um, worked at will be dependent upon two things first of all obviously as I say revenue and the space to be able to generate a role within through the planning process team expansion um and and also um simply speaking um delivery and performance so you know one of the things that i think is really important during a training contract is um is the willingness and want to be able to be a sponge to be able to spend as much time with people as possible to really be invested in the work that you're being asked to do, to not see it as purely transactional, um, but to actually use the opportunity to build relationships. One of the things that I was really lucky to experience was the fact that because there were so few trainees at Mishcons, you were doing work that my peers who had joined Herbert Smith or Alan Overy or Linklaters didn't even get to touch until they were sort of three or four years qualified. So I spent a lot of my training contracts trying not to sink and rather to swim, but actually the learning that I, um, I took from that and the opportunity to be able to build relationships with people for whom I would then ultimately go and work on a longer term basis um, was uh, invaluable. Um, and I think even if you are in, in, a, in an organization where you are, um, in that more transactional type of work because you're not allowed to see clients or you're not allowed to touch particular pieces of work you can still go and build up um, relationships and still express interest in a willing to and a willingness to learn currently a mentor to somebody who's a trainee at paul hastings and um and she is working in a, a team that doesn't this doesn't the work doesn't really interest her but that's okay because you know that's that's part of the whole process working out what you want to do and what you don't want to do but ultimately she um has herself then got involved in other projects across the firm um there's a particular gender project that she's got involved with and she's helping out again on graduate recruitment so going out and bringing people into the firm and all of these things ultimately add to your internal cv um, um i'm i'm very passionate about finding people and working with people when I was particularly in charge of graduate recruitment who who sought out those opportunities who saw the value in investing their time and energy into the firm which speaking honestly will probably have invested a huge amount of money in them by sponsoring their LPC fees maybe paying for their GDL fees paying for their professional qualifications um, and and that's an invaluable it's an invaluable opportunity for the individual and it's and and with the investment obviously it should hopefully reap um reap rewards so um i've got, well, I've got two questions for you one is going to be around when you first started law because obviously you went around different areas and be interesting to know that but the other thing you just touched upon is as you were in graduate recruit recruitment um if somebody was wanting to get a training contract with miss condorea mm. what did you look for in that person you've already said that the law degree itself could be seen as a bit dry so what other things or what would you look for in a person to kind of like show that they've got more broader characteristics and traits? so I, sp I remember spending a holiday and again this again is showing my age because this was all before everything now like if I, if I had to do this now every cv every application would be on my screen in front of me I literally went on holiday with like a pile of applications like yay big and um i'd work through them and there were three things that i always well two basics and three more broader fundamentals okay um the basics were um clarity of of written thought okay so i could easily tell easily make the distinction between individuals that had made an application for the sake of it 
and those that were genuinely interested in either the firm or a career in law. Okay. Um, now that takes a little bit of practice and a bit of um, talent. And actually one of the things that I'll happily offer to do as a result of this is that if any of the, if any of the um, cohort here are making applications or need some guidance in relation to content and how to answer questions, then I'm really happy to spend some time with people and take them through that. Thank you. Um, Thank no worries. No worries at all. Um, so, so there's, there's that kind of, that, that very, that thought piece um, is really important. And on that, I would have much rather seen an applicant spend a, a meaningful time on five applications to my firm and four others, rather than five minutes a piece to 35 law firms on a more scattergun approach. Okay. Um, the second thing that's a sort of a fundamental is, a, is, 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 um, is spelling and grammar. Um, and even if the content is struggling at times, I could always work out who was having their attention to detail as a lawyer, like attention to detail is like rule 101, because <laughs> if you haven't got attention to detail and you miss out a particular full stop in a clause, then you can find fundamentally change the meaning of a clause to the detriment of your client right like the, the the tiniest the tiniest little thing can make the the biggest difference and i can come i'll come on to some sort of the learnings from a training contract perspective as well um because again that goes to the that goes to the sort of value that you can create in terms of the um uh the sort of everything matters which i'll which i'll come on to um and then the second, the second thing I think I'm like the three broader themes. So number one, really doing your research about the firm to which you are applying. Um, that's, it's obvious to me when reading an application, whether or not someone's taken the time to read around um, about the firm, to look at news, websites, um, articles, interviews, and taking the time to look at um, the work that the firm is doing. You know, a lot of firms now are very keen on advertising and or explaining their services and describing their clients. And, and they are much more marketeer uh, focused than was ever the case 20 years ago. Okay. So, you know, making sure that answers to questions didn't like didn't go against the grain of whatever may have been publicized in terms of, of you know i always remember someone saying someone putting an answer in as to why they wanted to apply and like because your shipping practice is outstanding and like we don't have a shipping practice like that that's gone that application you haven't read you have you you don't understand the firm right okay? um and then looking to answer the questions in as honest a way as possible um by that i mean this there are um there were a lot of applications that i used to receive where i think people were answering the questions in a way that they thought we just wanted to hear the answers that that, that they thought we wanted rather than actually answering in their from a from the first person um so i um would always look for honesty and transparency i would also look for reflection so people being honest about their weaknesses or being honest about where things may not have actually gone well for them, um, I always found incredibly useful and gave real insight into someone's personality and um, life, right? It's, it's, it's simply not the case. It's simply not the case that no one has a blind spot or a weakness or a failing. Um, and I would much rather see honesty in relation to it than either brushing over it or not acknowledging it at all. Um, that actually was really important when it comes to when it came to grades um, and if if you can imagine you have to put in the grades that you receive at different um, levels of your education and obviously as is the case uh, for many many people events happen human nature arises issues occur which sometimes affect people's delivery in relation to their qualifications or their exam results and again where the events happen uh, happened I would much rather have seen someone be honest about the rationale why and be happy to find um, uh, to find the uh, 
period of reflection to explain to explain what had happened okay to explain why a particular a, a reason um me meant that a particular exam hadn't gone very well mm -hmm. um and then the final thing i would say is that um one shouldn't think that it's okay to just put down as much as they possibly think would be necessary or reasonable from an application perspective by which i mean this so lots and lots of applications where people would say um i got you know i i was on the first team of this i then like i really enjoy camping i really enjoy rowing i really enjoy i do, 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 do all of these extracurricular activities when actually the majority of them are just not either not correct or not something that's meaningfully um, undertaken by the individual and through the sort of the, the interview process if those people were successful in obtaining an interview then you would be able to discover that that's not correct and if actually you then sit in front of somebody and they can't substantiate the statement that's written in their application then um, it doesn't actually find uh, merit in terms of progression um, the the one thing that I will say as well, just about training contracts, Nate, uh, Naomi, sorry, is that um, every, every minute of a training contract means something, and every task that you are asked to do by a supervisor is for a particular reason, and it's normally unequivocally for an important reason. So I'll give you two examples in relation to that. Um, having been a trainee supervisor myself on quite a few occasions i um would often receive a bit of resistance um as to you know if i ask someone to do a particular job um for a particular reason sometimes you would experience resistance and i then had to take them through two stories of like personal experiences of my own so i always ask to imagine sort of the outcome so if you were doing a piece of litigation normally the um the most frequent outcome is that you are sitting in front of a judge um waiting to have your your client's case um heard and, and delivered by a barrister on on your behalf and um what would often happen is that the trainee and that would be me in this particular instance would be asked to prepare all the documentation that the judge would see and i remember being in my um i remember being in my first trial and my supervisor um sitting next to me and the barrister said um to the judge can you turn to page 160 in bundle b and my supervisor turned to me and said it better have be page 160 and it better have be the right document right because ultimately that's that's what it boils down to um but the, you know for me my job in that whole experience was making sure that every single document was the right document in the right order for the right reasons with the right numbers on them in the right folders and not actually delivering that would have affected my client's case i was junior at the time i was a baby but it was incredibly important and um it's important to be able to understand why every single piece of every single bit of work that you're asked to do, no matter how menial, frankly, you may find it, allows you to learn and, and absorb the matrix of all legal matters. Filling in forms, incredibly important. Get it wrong, your client, you know, everything has a consequence. And that's why I think um being that sponge and being willing to take on anything and do anything from a training contract perspective will stand you in really good stead that's really helpful advice is my sound difficult nay is that i was worried that you were but no one else has said that um that you find it charming unless no one else can access the group chat there was a time that you were a bit glitchy but you've come oh, back. sorry i don't know if it's you or my laptop i'm not sure but it's come yeah. back to the time i was a bit worried about it but it's, i think it's all right um I can hear fine, says so Zoe. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Good. Um, yes. Yeah, so as you just said, which was great, you, you went back and saying about the training contract and learning about detail and detail being so important, be it that you're in a training contract or be it that, you know, you're a partner of a law firm. It's all, it is all about the detail. Um, so in Mish Contraire, obviously, as you said, it's different isn't it? they be linked lasers or something, but what areas of law did they have and what areas of law did you do during your training contract? Yeah. 
Um, so Mishkan's was, um, it still is, divided up into four big practice areas. Uh, real estate, which is property, and that is then subdivided into um, three areas. Um, and this is how granular you can get in terms of your qualification, right, and where you end up honing your expertise. So subdivided into commercial property, um, residential property, or what's called sort of like litigation, so um, retail, um, sorry, real estate litigation, okay, so where people have disputes in relation to construction or boundaries or whatever it might be. Um, it has a corporate department, okay, um, which again is a massive umbrella for subdivisions. So sort of mergers and acquisitions, so buying and selling businesses. Um, commercial, so that's your work that you do if you are entering into um, an arrangement to, to I, I want you to sell me 25 widgets and we have to do a contract to get to the point where you can sell me 25 widgets. Um, it's also got um, uh, uh, an... Um, a betting and gaming division um it's got um, a tax division and within tax you then again subdivide okay um to do with the corporates or real estate because you've got particular real estate expertise often when it comes to tax and i've got i've got a very, i have a personal very very, very fascinating tax very fascinating and i actually think that certain um an interest in tax coupled with someone who is quite outgoing and easy to engage with and quite client friendly um is a is a is a is a is a pretty perfect combination tax can be incredibly dry and when you often meet tax lawyers to be very very general about this <laughs> they are often quite dry and you sometimes have to really work hard to crack the nut whereas actually if you can get a tax lawyer who is happy to be you know effervescent and out and about and and engaging with clients and can speak client in a way that is not dry and uh, comprehensible, um, they will undoubtedly be successful. Um, and then there was a what's called a private department, which is made up again of a number of different areas, uh, including divorce, family matters, so child and uh, uh, um, family and divorce areas really. Um, also included art law, very, very specific, but again, a very niche area for Mishcons and one of the most successful art lawyers in the country um, works at Mishcons and has worked for a very long time. Um, looking at um, wealth and asset management protection, trust, so looking at the family, the high net worth individual, um, looking at um, uh, sort of the, the the more personal aspects of, of private wealth okay um and um also looking at probate and death and sort of the, that sort of like holistic high net worth individual offering the employment team um grew from eight of us through to about 36 by the time i left so it was a huge it became its own department in its own right and um, then the final department is litigation which actually um probably amount uh, relates to about 50 percent of michelin's revenue it's huge and um it's made up again of a number of sub practices um fraud and banking intellectual property financial services um general litigation um arbitration criminal it, it, it goes on okay but um for me when i was there at Michigan's doing my training contract, um, the four big teams existed: the corporate, the um, uh, the private, and litigation and real estate. And I actually didn't do a real estate um, seat. So each each part of your training contract is called a seat. Um, so you have to do four seats, ideally um, minimum three, and um, I didn't do a real estate. Uh, oh, I know. Um, Helen says she can no longer hear me. Can, can can people say that whether they can hear Helen? Oh, sorry, Zoe. In the in the chat, can anyone else write in the chat? 
I can hear. I can hear. So it might be you, unfortunately. Okay. Sorry, Just sorry. Just everyone, um, if you can start writing some questions for Helen down into the chat, then we can look at that as well. Yeah. So I did four seats, uh, three seats, sorry, I didn't do four seats. I did three. Um, I did uh, an employee seat, I did a court seat, um, and which ironically was done at the quietest time. So I actually didn't do any transactions, but I had a great time nonetheless. Um, and I did a year of litigation. And the reason for that was because as I was in sort of like to month five of my litigation seat, I was in the middle of a huge trial. And so it was decided that I would stay on for a further six months so as to not disrupt the, um, the team structure for the client. Um, and as I said at the beginning of our conversation, Amy, my passion then lay with employment and I had the opportunity to then apply for a role as a newly qualified solicitor within the team. Fantastic. So you were litigating in the employment? Yeah, my, my wheelhouse is litigation, basically. Yeah, like, yeah, um, yeah. I, I know. And you were very good at it. Um, so I'm going to ask you, um, hopefully some people are going to ask some questions, but um, come on guys. But I just tell us what one of your career, tell us your career high. What is it with a case or with a change of scene or whatever? What has it been? What's been your career high so far, obviously? Um, I think for me, so when I was at, when I was in, when I was at Michigan's in private practice, um, one of the things that you'll hear about employment lawyers is that they often act for either individuals or for organizations. One of the benefits of Michigan's was that it was had sort of a 50, 50 client base. Um, but I probably acted more for individuals than I did for organizations. And um, one of the real highs for me was acting on behalf of uh, individuals where they had really been treated poorly, like really treated poorly by their employers. Um, and on a couple of occasions, I did some big, I did, I did some big discrimination cases. Um, something that I feel quite passionately about personally. Um, and I um, also had the privilege of working, being the trainee, um, which goes back to the story that I talked about earlier in terms of the bundles and the documents, but being the trainee on the first um, case that was heard by the High Court in relation to um, bonus disputes, where an individual had been treated incredibly badly by um, his manager, and had suffered a nervous breakdown and as a result had been very unwell and for lots of other reasons had not received remuneration, bonus, etc. and um, ended up being fired. And so we acted on his behalf and I was the trainee in that case and it was the most incredible experience, um, not least because I was able to work closely with the client directly and my supervisor and the partner at the time and the work that we did has actually been has been um, groundbreaking in terms of law. So really set the scene for the um, the work that was then done by the courts moving forward in relation to bonus um, bonus disputes. Really cool. Um, and we've got some questions, Helen. Yeah. Um, could you please tell us more about in-house law? Yeah, we were going to touch on that. And um, how is it different from working in a firm? So when you're an in-house lawyer. Um, it depends on two things actually. So what you'll find is that the world of in-house, I'm going to really crudely divide this up to help explain, but by rule of thumb is that your in-house um, roles are either specific to a particular practice. So if you had a multinational organization or a huge, like, um, okay, let's say Tesco's, for example, okay. Um, it will have its own dedicated in-house practice. It will continue to work with external lawyers, but it will have a number of lawyers working within its in-house team. And each of those lawyers will have an area of speciality. So it'll have an in-house employment lawyer, an in-house commercial lawyer, an in-house intellectual property lawyer, okay, and so on and so forth, all reporting up to a general counsel that would be then responsible for all of those um, in-house lawyers. Um, smaller businesses, and I don't mean like five person businesses, I probably mean sort of like, you know, hundred to a thousand, 
may have the more traditional general counsel roles, which is a lawyer who is responsible for working across all aspects of the organization from a legal perspective. So having responsibility for the lease, having responsibility for intellectual property, having responsibility for dealing with employment problems or with tax or with whatever it might be. Um, and what that person does is often manage the in manage the legal flow of work um, within the organization and more regularly engage with external counsel so in a private practice to help support on particular transactions or particular issues that arise but you become a bit more of a jack of all trades so you kind of have to know the basics in relation to um more areas of expertise than you would obviously if you were specializing in one area in a, in, in a law firm now when i move to my client that's what i end up having to do so i end up having to upskill myself <laughs> Um, after 20 years in private practice of understanding more about the commercial commercial law, intellectual property, licensing arrangements, real estate, etc. So it's a huge learning curve if you haven't done it from sort of the outset. Um, uh, but one that I think is really rewarding, particularly because you help, you can help really influence the strategic direction of an organization and its success. Um, you know, you're there to not only fight the fires, but to make sure that they don't even start. So, um, you know, I have a number of, of, of friends and colleagues who've either done in-house work um, on a secondment basis. So they work in a law firm and then go and work for a client for six months in that client's business or who have moved from um, private practice into into an in-house role and like really enjoyed it. You often find, if I'm speaking candidly, that the hours are better in an in-house role because you don't tend to have work. Um, the extensive hours that you might work if you work in the city of London in a, in a law firm, mm -hmm. but ultimately, I mean, it's swings and roundabouts because there will always be occasions where we have to work late, but um, it's, um, it's a good role. It's a good job, but I would certainly, you know, where would you start, Helen? Would you would you say would it be better to start maybe um, not in house and then go in house, or can you, you know, kind of get your legs somewhere beforehand? Yeah, I would. I was about to go on and say that I would always recommend going to work to learn your trade in a law firm. Yeah, and then move across into an in house role if that was something that was attractive to you. Um, the I would say that the that there are there are organisations, um, huge corporations that now offer in-house training contracts, but the experience that you get is limited to that one business. Whereas in private practice, working in a law firm, you will be exposed to many different clients, many different types of businesses, many different types of individuals, and. Um, the the knowledge that you can amass as a result of that work and those relationships will stand you in amazing stead for when you do move into if you decided to move into the in-house um arena cool that's that's great great answer um uh, maya rose says oh, um what has been the biggest struggle within your career and what <laughs> i know you have well helen and, <laughs> and what advice would you give to overcome this oh goodness me um oh that's a really tough question that's a really tough question um okay i'll tell you what my biggest struggle has been imposter syndrome okay so for the i'd be honest so i um stay educated non-selective um was the first person in my family to go to university. I um, had genuinely no idea what I was doing <laughs> um, and surrounded by people both at university, if I'm being really honest with you, and also um, in my career who have come from walks of life very different to my own. Um, and sometimes with that comes a little bit of uh, self-doubt in terms of aptitudes, intelligence, and sometimes 
it's not about not making mistakes because we all make mistakes and the most important thing is that you learn from them um but having strength in your own character and your own ambition and i've never been a geeky geeky lawyer and i've always been very open with that but what i do know is that compared to some of my peers where they might excel tenfold in relation to the recollection of a particular piece of legislation that i would never be able to do what i can do is have that i have much better commercial acumen um, and relationship and networking abilities um, and uh, i have a huge amount of empathy and i know that that stands me in great stead compared to to, to peers who can be very academic when it comes to the law um, but perhaps less able to um, build up that relationship with clients in the same way that I could and it's that in that in that in law it can be quite elitist um, I think it's getting better as a industry um, Mishcon for way of example has launched something very recently which I think is brilliant which is an apprenticeship style training contract program that lasts over um, six years something that I would highly recommend um, you look at um, I can, I'll, I'll dig out the details name and you can circulate it. Mm -hmm. um, but with that has come a real interest in reaching individuals who don't have that traditional Redbrook University experience, who haven't got a 2-1, but actually are bright, engaged people who are passionate about working in a law firm um, and being a solicitor. And that opportunity is, a, is an incredible one. Um, but yeah, the, the, the um, Regrettably, I could, I mean, I could spend the next two hours talking to you about, about gender, imposter and all that kind of stuff. But um, having the strength in your own character, um, it takes a lot. And, um, and in terms of overcoming it, um, it, periods of reflection, I think, really help. Um, and not always listening to the white noise that goes on um, around you and people's chat in terms of their... Um, their thoughts about their own successes or their own um, their, their own strengths, um, and knowing that, uh, as one of my old partners um, used to say to me, or did say to me, sorry, um, if you're a good person and you're a good lawyer, the good will out, and you will be successful. Um, but keeping you know grounded and remembering that is something that you have to sometimes just knock yourself into shape and, and continue to remember. Thank you, Helen. That was a great answer. Um, okay, so looking and so and Myra said the same. So thank you. And um, when looking at CVs, it is generally is it generally preferred they be straightforward, bullet pointed, even or in a explanatory sections? Um, I think it genuinely. And this is not. A, this is a cop out, but it's not a cop out. I think it depends on the question. So um, I. And I think actually your presentation of your answers can go a long way and bullet points do help achieve that because if you can imagine someone reading just hundreds of applications, um, succinct, nice, easy to read language in a bullet point format is better, is easier on the eye and therefore you've got a better chance of it actually being absorbed. Um, you know, if I've read applications where the pages just go on and on and on, um, it's human nature right you lose interest so um uh, i would highly recommend bullet points if you can do just an, allow the flow of the answer of the question to move through the bullet points um and uh to keep you know each bullet point each paragraph to sort of two three maximum four sentences great Damn. thank you um does anybody else have any more questions for helen was there a duty which you were not doing? Um, no, actually. Um, moving from private practice to becoming the general counsel and COO for my client was one of the most daunting things I've ever done. I didn't think, I, 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 in, in all transparency, the role was slightly missold to me. Um, so when I actually got there, I ended up having to take on work that I genuinely never thought I'd even touch. However, um, as difficult as it was at the time for many reasons, um, the learning that 
I took from it and the experience that I gained um, has allowed me to now do the role that I'm doing. Had I not done that role, I would not be doing the work that I'm doing now. And one of the reasons why I decided to leave private practice was for well, two reasons. First of all, I was desperate to go and work in a business. I'd grown up, my, my father was um, self-employed and had his own business, small business. Um, and I've sort of grown up with that entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and the second is that I just didn't know whether or not I could picture myself, like genuinely close my eyes and picture myself sitting behind my desk in my law firm at the age of 55. Um, without having gone to try something else. And because Michigan's is such a great place to work, I was never going to work in another law firm. I was always going to go and do something different if that's what I was going to do. Um, so the one thing I would say is any opportunity that presents itself, like think about it, take it, experience it. Um, uh, and, um, and don't say no without, without there being a really good reason. Cool. Thank you. There's um. There's just Darcy asked a really good question. Actually, are there any books or journals that you oh, know? It's moved up my. Um, it's okay. That I would recommend reading. And how do I keep up my studies and not get overwhelmed? Um, books and journals. So I'll pull together a, a list of things, um, Darcy, and I'll send them across to Naomi. Um, uh, it would be good to know as well separately, Darcy, where you are in terms of your own. Um, studies at what level but i'll um i'll definitely send that out um and make sure you get that and in terms of not being overwhelmed with studies um one of the things that i mean i can be really honest with you i i was overwhelmed myself on many occasions um but with a law degree it really is about keeping on top of everything on a regular basis because the course is huge and you would probably end up uh, genuinely being overwhelmed if you didn't keep on top of everything. Um, so taking stuff in bite-sized chunks um, on a regular basis I think is really important. Um, and also reflecting on the fact that um, there will always be things that you're just not going to know and that's okay. And provided you've, you know, you've taken in the majority and you can talk about the majority, that's, that's going to be okay as well, right? It's not about getting 100% on everything because no one expects that. But certainly remembering that, I think, is a really important thing. Cool. That's good. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question, Helen, because I can see the yeah. time. Um, a lot of the guys here will maybe have, will be finishing their year now at university or school if they're just leaving and and I mean there is still a lockdown ish in place um what could they be doing now um I know you say about reading but are there any other things that they could be doing to hone their skills not even not their knowledge but their skills as well mm. a better lawyer that's a really interesting question actually um there will be some books that I, I mean there's some there's a lot of there's some business books that I think would be really good to read um the sort of the more strategic thinking i think is is incredibly important um uh when it comes to when it comes to practicing law irrespective of the area because a lot of it is about negotiation right so it's about engaging with an opponent because often even if you're in a real estate transaction you're going to be against somebody right so I think the, the strategy, the negotiation, these are all skills that you can be reading about and understanding more about. Um, often some like the psychology side of things I think is really interesting. Um, and certainly I would be using the time to research and look at firms um, mm -hmm. depending upon your area of, of interest and making sure that you're ready to go and you're alive to when applications may start opening up again. Um, for internships. I am aware that a few law firms are doing internships virtually this, this summer um, yeah. and some are just cancelling it all together um, but I would certainly be keeping a short list and keeping an eye out or signing up for updates and that's the other thing now obviously in a time of, of, um, of the internet a lot of law firms now allow you to subscribe for um, updates on publications that they send out or information in relation to changes or anything that happens in relation to the firm or that's published. So I would certainly be subscribing to those things and keeping abreast of changes um, or announcements or 
published, uh, you know, published literature, etc., that that is circulated. That's really good advice. Um, well, it's it's eight oh three. I think you could go on forever. This is absolutely fascinating, and I know that you've given so much advice and information over the last hour. I really, I everybody will be, must have been taking copious notes, I'm sure. Um, I think I might have everybody's email address on, on the list, but if not, everybody has my email address. So if you want anything, please send me an email because you all have my email address and Helen will send me information and I can forward it out to all of you. Um, Helen, it's been brilliant, absolutely. It's been a pleasure fascinating and thank you so much thank my absolute you. pleasure thank you guys thank you for listening to me and um i will send Naomi that information and good luck with everything and anything i can help with just let me know cheers all right have a good evening thank you everyone. take care bye, bye guys thank you thank you bye now